Funding for this program is provided by Annenberg CPB to advance excellent teaching. It was a time rather like ours of large impersonal states and individuals who felt lost in them, a time of consumption, brutality, sophistication, experimentation, and trying to find justification and consolation in religious cults. The Hellenistic Age, this time on the Western tradition. Now UCLA professor Eugen Weber's continuing journey through the history of Western civilization. Last time we ended with the waning of the independent Greek cities, the polis, and the decay of their classical disciplines in the three centuries before Christ. But this was not, as you might expect, an era of decline. On the contrary, once the grip of the polis was weakened, a new spirit of openness arose in the Hellenistic age, a spirit of experimentation and diversity. The most striking example of this was in art. The artists of the classical period imposed standards that were outside and beyond the change and decay that are part of human life. But the artists of the Hellenistic age tried to embrace those very qualities of humanity that go with change and with a variety of life. Classical perfection was pure, austere, unchanging. The artists of classical and pre-classical Greece had aimed at forms that could be regarded as timeless and ideal, calm, fixed in their perfection. But then everything loosened up. The statues of the Hellenistic age move like human beings. They express human emotions. They strive for greater realism, for movement for sensuality. This is the art of a society that's sufficiently pleased with itself not to want to imitate gods and heroes. Fortune is no longer enthroned in stiff majesty. She sits like a normal woman. Aphrodite flows and curves in a sinuous movement. Victory alights on the prow of a ship and you can feel the wind pressing the folds of her dress against her body. And then all this technical virtuosity becomes exaggerated in statues like this one of Laocon and his sons entangled in what appears to be a giant strand of pasta, but which is actually a snake that goddess Athena sent to kill them. In this respect, the Hellenistic Greeks were rather like ourselves, admiring moderation, but often going to extremes. But if much of this art with its Baroque convolutions and grotesque sugary pathos is less admired than its classical predecessors, it's also more natural, more dramatic, more dynamic. And it is also more inclined to historical references. This is the first age of museums, collections, libraries, private and public, and of archaeology. So what some denounced at the time as fragmentation and alienation in a vast impersonal state, others 
appreciate as greater independence in a more open, less constricting society. Polis directed art goes out, individual directed art comes in. We get portraits in busts and paintings that are not idealized but lifelike. We get landscapes and still lives, which would have been completely irrelevant when only gods and the polis mattered. And now the center of literary life is not Athens, as it had been for so long, but the new Hellenistic city of Alexandria, which produces psychological speculation and biography and autobiography. In this theatrical scene, lovers struggle not against gods, but against parents and rivals, and the references are not to higher values, but to wills and dowries and stolen letters, as in modern entertainment. And the public also wants happy endings, not just the inevitably grim misadventures of classical Greek tragedy. There is a wider market for art now, and there is a greater variety in public taste. It's less grand, less noble than that of the 5th or 6th century BC. It mirrors a more vulgar society, insecure, uneasy, excited, but livelier, much like our own. Another familiar aspect of the Hellenistic world is that one's social experience in the community had shifted from an accessible human scale where you could affect your environment if you wanted to, to a fragmented, depersonalized society. If you wanted to lead a good life, you could no longer say, as Plato said, let's make a good society, good society make good men, good men lead good lives. And if you wanted to play a part in the world, you could no longer just stay in your polis because the polis mattered less and less. You had to enter the service of one of the great kings who ruled in Macedonia or Egypt or Syria. These kings now ruled so many different peoples that they were practically forced to take over the oriental tradition of a godlike king because that alone could bind so many different territories and tribes and cities uh, to their rule. Even the lesser kings had pretensions based on Alexander's claims to divinity. But such pretensions, were completely contrary to Greek values. So something had to give. And if it wasn't going to be the kings, it was going to have to be the Greeks. In the fourth century BC, when Alexander wrote back to Greece asking to be worshiped as a god, the Spartans, for one, took it calmly with a mixture of practicality and skepticism. If he wants to be a god, they said, let him be god. You can see where this led by looking at Antiochus I of Commagene, a Hellenistic king of the first century BC. When he built his tomb at Nemrut Dag, which is now in Turkey, Antiochus cut off the top of a mountain 8,200 feet high and had it replaced with a tumulus, a grave mound 400 feet high, with colossal statues of Greek and Persian gods in whose midst he sits enthroned, a god among the gods. Hubris on this scale was a radical break with the Greek tradition of moderation. It also offended Greek ideas of the dignity of free men, subject only to the laws of the polis. But the days of the autonomous polis were long gone. Now the power rested with the kings. So the problem arose. How was a free-thinking man supposed to adapt himself to the new situation? What should he do if he wanted to live as a good man, an honest man, stand by his principles? 
Should he remain aloof? Should he act? And if he was going to act, by what rules should he act? This is the problem of the various Hellenistic schools of philosophy, the problems, the problem they had to face. And while they answered it differently, they all agreed that man must find the source of freedom and justice within himself. Freedom in classical times consisted of obeying the law of your city and its gods. But in the Hellenistic age, it would have to consist of an internal freedom that comes from being at one with the cosmic order and with oneself. The wise man is free even if he is a slave as long as he can establish and retain his eternal freedom. If he is his own master, then he has no master. No human can intimidate him. Passions, fears, greed, desires cannot shake his equanimity. He doesn't feel the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. Indeed, he learns not to worry about chance or fate or fortune at all because he is more autonomous than any polis could be. The cynics, whose best-known representative was the philosopher Diogenes, had one of the many recipes for achieving such autonomy and detachment. Essentially, the cynics believed in being poor, rude, and unconventional, dropping out of society, avoiding family or any kind of property, and begging to stay alive. Diogenes himself lived in a barrel or whatever other shelter he could find in the Athens streets. This is a 16th century depiction of a famous story about him in which Alexander comes to ask if there's anything he can do for the old man, at which point Diogenes asks him to get out of his light. This is one way to avoid fate, give up everything and be rude to others. Another way is to avoid the others and the world, except for a few kindred souls and the basic essentials you need to lead a civilized life. Avoid pain, avoid worry and the anxieties that come with worldly interests. Seek only pleasure. The word hedonism is derived from the Greek word for pleasure, but these were not vulgar pleasures of the body, but rather the satisfaction derived from having your mind at rest. This was the doctrine of the philosopher Epicurus, who lived from 341 to 270 BC. Since his doctrine recommended dropping out of the world, it never had much political or historical influence. Epicurus's more successful rival was Zeno, who lived from 335 to 263 BC. It's significant that where Epicurus taught his philosophy in a private garden, Zeno taught his in a public arcade a stoa like this one. And stoicism, the name of Zeno's philosophy, is much more about public concerns than Epicureanism is because it teaches that internal freedom comes from being in tune with the order of the universe. Perceive the cosmic order, says Zeno, Grasp the ruling will of the universe, then submit to it, and you are free. That, at least, was the Stoics' view of spiritual autonomy. But they also believed that you couldn't just ignore the world outside, because it was a reflection, however pale, of the cosmic order. And the wise man, they taught, can see the relationship between the two. It's the wise man's duty 
to restore and improve order in the world around him, to bring the everyday world in line with the cosmos, to counsel the despots who have power to act, and so turn kings into philosophers. So, where the cynics were anarchists and the Epicureans were passive contemplators, the Stoics were conservative political activists who, rather as the Puritans were going to do, cheerlessly took on the burdens of the world. Yet, however reluctant the Stoic appears, his philosophy is positive because he teaches that a higher order governs the world and that it's the duty of good men to uphold the nobler values which are their own reward. A third century biographer of Greek philosophers, Diogenes Laertius, listed the principles of Stoic philosophy. He wrote, the end may be defined as life in accordance with nature, or in other words, in accordance with our own human nature, as well as that of the universe. A life in which we refrain from every action forbidden by the law common to all things, that is to say, the right reason which pervades all things. Now this Stoic belief in a moral law of nature comprehending all people was then translated into Roman legal terms and it became the sanction behind large-scale government and it was passed on to the Middle Ages and beyond. And Stoic beliefs also made a major contribution to Christianity. As you can see from the works of Epictetus, a Greek philosopher who lived from 60 to 120 AD. This is what he wrote. You, O man, are God's principal work. You are a distinct portion of the essence of God and contain a certain part of him in yourself. Why then are you ignorant of your noble birth? It is within yourself that you carry him, and you do not observe that you profane him by impure thoughts and unclean actions. In the meantime, however, there is another darker aspect of the Hellenistic period, the persistence and popularity of primitive mystery religions. These women are participants in Dionysiac cult rites. Only the initiated learn the secrets to the mysteries of life, and so only they are afforded salvation. Whether these mystery cults worshipped Isis or Serapis from Egypt, Mithras from Persia or others, they all had this in common, they were the business of the individual, not the polis. They took no account of political responsibilities and they bound people together in communities of worshippers quite independent of the state religion. The simplest of these were the good old earth religions like the Eleusinian cult you see depicted here or the Dionysiac cults. This is Dionysius himself, the god of fertility, wine and drama. In all of the cults a young king appears who is the bearer of spring and a new summer. He appears as the savior of the earth, which winter had made cold and lifeless, and which all the pollutions of the past had doomed to barrenness. And by an extrapolation, the young king is also the savior and purifier of mankind from all kind of evils, bringing a new age to the world. Then there is the lady, 
the old earth or fertility goddess, the mother or sister or wife of the savior, who is often both a virgin and a mother, and who appears all around the Mediterranean in a variety of shapes and names. Lastly, there are the heavenly bodies, the sun seen here in his chariot, the moon, the stars represented by these boys who dive out of sight when the dawn comes. Over the centuries, this worship came gradually into contact with a more definite sun worship of Persia, and eventually it brought us the cult of Mithras, the unconquered sun who is seen here slaughtering a bull to guarantee the return of the seasons. Mithras became particularly popular in Rome in the second century and proved to be the chief rival of Christianity. After the sun, there were the planets in their seven spheres surrounding the earth. Their movement reflected the will of providence. Their power affected everything, even the days of the week. Next to these heavenly bodies, life and human endeavor are a vain thing. So the religion of later antiquity becomes absorbed in plans of escape from the prison of Earth, her sister planets, and the other lesser stars. Men and women are the sport of fate and chance, to say nothing of the native ills and demons of the Earth. But if you could move away past the sphere of the earth, past the sphere of the moon and of the other rulers of the universe. Then you could get to the sphere of the ultimate God, whatever his name may be, where there is true being and freedom. And more than freedom, the ultimate union with God. The kind of knowledge which would enable you to get to this point must be taught. Men must be initiated as in this ceremony in a temple of Isis. So here you have priests and prophets and teachers. But above all, you have the figure of a redeemer, a godly savior, who is connected with figures like Attis or Adonis in Asia Minor, Osiris in Egypt, Dionysius in Greece, and the special Jewish idea of the Messiah who would save the chosen people. This Redeemer has various names, particularly that of Christos, of anointed. And above all, he is in a very profound sense man, or the son of man, even though he is also a god. The logic goes this way. Since the ultimate unseen god, spirit though he is, made man in his own image, it follows that god is himself man. He is the real the ultimate, perfect, eternal man of whom all bodily people are just feeble copies. So this God and ideal or first man is the father, while the redeemer, the savior, is his son, the image of the father or the son of man. Usually this savior comes down from heaven to save mankind. And then when his work is done, he goes back to heaven to sit by the side of the Father in glory. And thereafter, the chosen people he has saved will be able to join him. Of course, you can see the similarities with later Christian doctrine. But you must notice too that these early mystery cults, including the mysteries of the Gnostics who influenced some early Christians and against whom other Christians reacted, that all these mystery cults were exclusive, just as the Hebrew religion was exclusive. They were a set of cliques of chosen people, each with their particular contract or password to salvation. 
Whereas, as we shall see in due course, the Christians were going to realize the universal implications of these cults in a much more effective way. For the moment, I would just point out this. It's impossible not to see these religious developments as emotional aids for men and women who without them felt that they faced the world alone and who found their native powers were simply not up to the ordeal. But out of this process, there grew a new kind of self-consciousness, a sense of personal privacy and internality, such as the Greek of the classical age never possessed. Men and women were slowly making souls for themselves, and they were making churches too, whose values and rights and institutions stood for the first time outside the political community for better or for worse. Next time, I shall talk about the rise of Rome. <laughs> Funding for this program is provided by Annenberg CPB to advance excellent teaching. For information about this and other Annenberg CPB programs, call 1-800-LEARNER and visit us at www.learner.org.